Well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this episode of Coaching Conversations. Um, I'm delighted that you can um, join us for this webinar. And I'm delighted to have two of my long-term friends, Mike James and Larry Jurovic, who I've worked with over a long period of time um, across British tennis. Um, and I've had the pleasure of, of being on court with these two, and, and they were what I would call some of the two of the greatest coaches and coach educators in the world. So firstly, welcome to you both. And I would love you to give you just the chance to give a brief overview of yourselves before we start. So Mike, can I come to you first so you can just give the, uh, the, the listeners a bit of an understanding of you know, who you are, where you work and what you do? Yeah, sure, Simon. Um, and thanks for having me on. Look forward to it. So I am Director of Tennis at uh, Holton Tennis Centre, which is a medium-sized uh, tennis centre just outside London, sort of 30, 40 miles outside London where I've been really since 1993. So I've had serious longevity in, in one place, had two or three years away, but uh, my pretty much my whole professional life has been based um, from that venue where I've developed a, a long-term team, a program under Every Ball Tennis is, yeah, is the name of the it. coaching program business that we've Correct. developed over the years. Do some work for the LTA in terms of coach education on the performance side with the level four senior performance uh, coach qualification, where I worked a long time with you, Simon, and previously even with Larry. So, um, but I'm still very much steeped in, in, in coaching. I'm on court pretty much every day working with players, working with my team of coaches, 12, 13 coaches, and um, delivering a, a club program, a kind of cradle to tour club program, we'd like to call it. So, yep, that's me. Well, listen, that's fantastic, Mike. Thank you so much uh, for giving that. Larry, if I can hand it over to you, um, that would be great. So, thanks for having <laughs> me, Simon. And uh, Mike, so nice to see you again, that's for sure. Really uh, looking forward to doing this, so thank you. Um, for me, I guess I've been at this for a really long time, but definitely not the, the same consistency of location as Mike. I, I started, I grew up in Canada. I started coaching here unbelievably fortunate to get a chance to uh, meet and be mentored by Louis Kaye and that opened up all sorts of doors for me so I ran an academy in Ireland for five years um, I've worked for the Lawn Tennis Association obviously that was mostly in a coach education capacity worked as a national coach for Tennis China so lots of different roles all over the place with coaching and and coach education but for the last six years I've started my own company out here just outside of Vancouver in British Columbia and we we've now built uh, owned and operate three indoor or tennis facilities out in greater Vancouver and that's taken the majority of my time over the last six years but at the same time as doing that uh, I've been able to stay on court about 20 hours a week so I'm still uh, still involved in coaching but we're really happy with the last facility opening here in April that I'll be able to put more of my energy uh, and we're really um, now trying to up the sort of standard of everything that we're doing right from the cradle to the tour. I'm stealing that right away, Mike. That, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We have over a thousand kids in the program starting from red ball, uh, but the end goal is to develop professionals. And, and I think we've now got the infrastructure with the facilities and the coaching team and everything required to achieve that goal. Larry, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, thanks to the two of you. I guess we should make a start. Let, let's get going right away and say that you know, today's episode is on coaching mistakes. Uh, with the core objective of exploring lessons throughout each of our careers, um, either things that have happened directly to us or that we've witnessed through others, vicariously through others or, or actually in real time. So it's, for me, this is a fascinating topic to discuss because it's a certainty that as you navigate through life, there are times when we will make errors probably in a multitude of ways and that has a severe impact on us and on others. So, Mike, I'm going to start with you, if I can, and just ask you to start thinking about, OK, well, has there been something that really stands out to you that you want to share that you've witnessed in your coaching um, by others or by yourself that you think is a great insight that you want to share with our candidates? Because I guess that's the objective today, that in some small way, through some of the, <laughs> the learnings that we've had in our careers, that we, that we move the dial forwards and help maybe younger coaches, less experienced coaches, um, have an insightful exposure to some of the things that could go wrong and therefore actually prevent you from doing those mistakes mm -hmm. uh, to the same level that we did. So, Mike, do you want to open up first and just have a little chat about that? Yeah, sure, Simon. I mean, I, in front of me, I've got a, a, a list as long as my arm of uh, all the mistakes <laughs> that I've made. But I suppose just thinking about the idea of mistakes, I, 
I do sort of put the caveat in front of it that if we're not making mistakes, then we're not pushing um, the boundaries enough. We're being perhaps too safe um, and maybe not extending, getting the most out of our coaching relationships. So in a way, you know, mistakes help us navigate, you know, to go forward. And it's just about a not making the same mistake too many times, <laughs> and b really, really learning from those mistakes. But I mean, I'll just I'll just kick off with a particular area, I guess, of interest to me, which is around how we take on players um, as coaches. And I think where I've made mistakes in the past is perhaps taking on a player where there is already an obvious clash in perhaps values and behaviors I, I work a lot with with um you know younger players when i say younger players you know out of mini tennis up to 17 18 junior tennis primarily so so not so much in 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 the higher echelons of the game um but i think it's that that taking on a player who you think will be or or, or could be kind of high profile for the program yet understanding and having that sort of feeling that mm, is, is there too big a clash here in terms of, we, we talk a lot about having a values fit in our program. So whether that's taking on new coaches or whether that's taking on players, just really getting a feel for a values fit and how much we feel that the environment um, and the relationship that we're going into might be able to influence that. But I think I can think back on a number of occasions where actually I would have been better off to say, no, um, I'm not taking you on. And, um, and, and Mike, Mike, what, OK, so that's a, that's a great if I can jump in there, because I want us to use the three of us to push each other's intellectual capacity to right to the edge until we squeeze each other to get to the bottom of these things. So we really understand them in a level of detail. So having a values based system is important. And that's not just the case of you know, tribes have been having values for thousands of years. So that's something that's historically built into us, evolutionary wise. You need a values based system in order to guide you through life, in order to have principles to hang your hat on, to go back to core fundamentals of both behavior, culture, um, uh, ways to move forward in the world. Why would we jeopardize our values then? So I think there's two parts to that is how do you as a coach develop those values? You know, a young coach may be looking at this going, well, I'm just 22 years of age. I don't really feel like I'm experienced enough yet to have those values. So that's the first point. Second point is I work in a team that, and we're all very different and diverse. And what does values mean to different people within a team? And, and then lastly is why would you have compromised those values in order to have a named player within your academy? What, 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 cause after fracture yeah well i think those 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 are all really in, interesting questions that you pose and i suppose in terms of developing values you know i i simply describe values as something that you hold if, if you break a value let's say you break one of your own values you're, you're left you, you're left feeling ah you know that I don't feel good about that, and and I think that's one way of starting to define your own values. If you're a young coach, is is what are they going to be around respect, integrity, um, the way that you might, the way that you might bring young players through in the game, and and what are your values around that? And I think it's when when you start to develop these. As, as young coaches, you start to develop these kind of values that you feel, actually, if I go ahead with this, I'm in danger of compromising those things. Um, it, it's, it's an, a lot of it can be, especially with young coaches, and, and certainly in my situation when I was a lot younger, it's an ego-driven thing. You, you, you want to build your profile. You want to be involved with, with uh, good players, higher-level players. If you're working in performance, you think that might attract other players to the program. So there's lots, of, there's lots of things that might encourage you to take that sort of decision. Yeah. Um, in, in my experience, it's, it rarely works out. And, yeah. and I, you know, I certainly have that also in, in recruitment around around coaches and the feeling of actually I've made a poor appointment and how quickly and how much courage do I have to actually change that appointment 
you know, early on in the relationship, or do you let that kind of develop and develop? And um, again, that's rarely ended well for me. So I don't think I've answered any of your your, your, your questions. I you have. You, chess, but, uh, yeah. you, you absolutely have. I mean, Larry, your 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 centre. You have values within your coaching team, don't you? And your coaching culture. Do you want to just touch on what Mike said there as well? Yeah, it's, it's such a great point that Mike brings up and something that I've been reflecting on a lot lately. So I, I love talking to tennis people because my non-tennis friends go crazy when I use analogies uh, all the time related to tennis. But this is this is what I'm trying to teach my leaders these days. I say like, you know, we know that technically we'd say that being able to identify what the ball's doing after contact, we call that perception, right? And trying to identify what the ball will do before contact, we call that anticipation. And so I'm trying to challenge my leaders all the time that instead of just perceiving things already happening, that it's their job to start to anticipate with all the experience they have. And uh, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that uh, I found myself in positions where I'm anticipating this player or parent relationship ending badly just because of uh, contradictions and values and things like that uh, way before it ever ends and I, I start to realize now I'm just going to stop allowing myself to start those relationships you know and, and it does 100% I don't think that's exactly what Mike meant by ego but for me it definitely becomes an ego check where uh, somebody who clearly doesn't align with the values and what we're trying to do um, but in my mind I have I would have the ego to think maybe I can change that and I've just come to the conclusion that it's really really challenging to change people's values and uh, and I just don't bother anymore you know it's I'm just I'm too old for that you know we, we start with people uh, that we anticipate can go right from cradle to grave uh, within our value structure and um, and work nicely in our tennis family it's, it's a really good point because I agree Mike and 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 you know, values to me is about rank order preference. It's about what do you value over something else? And, you know, and, and, and the word is, it's, words are powerful. They're like atom bombs, you know, they can make a lot of impact with people and the culture within, the, within your working. And, and if people are not living out those values with, with behaviors that are linked to them, then it's very difficult to actually have, have a great working environment. And the environment can be toxic at, at worst. And, and in the end, you can live out these drama triangles, as Dr. David Emerald would say, you know, these where there's a, an oppressor, a rescuer and a victim and everyone's playing those roles at all different times. And that's a dark place to be in all the time because it can exhaust the coach. I think a lot of performance coaching especially can be exhausting because of the relationship. It's not the parent per se. It's the trio that's exhausting. Yeah. Uh, it's something that I learned very early on in my, in my coaching that I'm going to share with people. And I wasn't going to do this so early, but it fits in nicely is. I realized very early on that I wasn't just coaching the player. So I was coaching the parent and the player. And sometimes I was coaching the parent player and the coach, me. I was coaching the relationship. You know, it's like a, I have a friend who went to divorce counseling. He said very rarely were they talking to me. Very rarely were they talking to her. They were all the time talking to us, we. And, and I realized that very early, early on in my coaching that if I was going to be a successful player development coach, I had to coach the relationship. Um, and actually, Louis would talk about that a lot in doubles. You coached Jamie, you coached Bruno Suarez, and you coached the pair. And so I, I probably picked it up from there. I just, just realized where I got it from. But, but, but that made sense to me very early on, that in order to be a meaningful coach, you had to, uh, and to avoid the drama triangles happening all the time, that there needed to be open, transparent relationships between player, parent, and coach. And that would only strengthen the more you started to talk out those things. And if you saw the £50 an hour, it's £40 for the player, and it's £10 for the parent, uh, or it's 50 minutes for the player and it's 10 minutes for the parent, but everybody deserves bandwidth and airtime of the coach's time, rather than having an exhaustive relationship on text or WhatsApp or, um, or them phoning you in the evening when you get home from work that causes additional time that you haven't scheduled in, and then you become resentful, and then it's, it actually builds over time to quite a toxic relationship. So it, it can start off small. Yeah. It can start off really small. And it can grow fast and ugly. And, and it's all because you didn't negotiate your terms at the very, very start. And what you and some of your terms are your principles or what people would call maybe values. So that, that's a great lesson already that I think we've explored, which, is, which has been a healthy start. It also brings me, um, this will be interesting because all three of us have been exposed to a global plethora of approaches in coaching. You know, it's Louis, Eva Van Arken, um, Patrice Haslier, I and mean, we had a lot of people come to the LTA 
Um, you know, the old definition of an expert is someone with a foreign accent. And we've certainly been exposed to a lot of foreign accents over time. And I think what coaches are finding very difficult at the moment is finding the right degree of difference, the right degree of, of, of conformity to fit in, whereas having the right degree of difference to be unique and to be themselves. And I think that's a real challenge. And I, one of the lessons that I think I've learned as I've got older is to not run with the crowd. It's very easy to run with the, oh, the LTA, we've got to go with it. Oh, this is the way to teach a forearm, we've got to go with it. This is the new fad on the chimp paradox, we've got to do that. This is the new fad on open stance, everything's open stance. So people follow trends, they follow fads. I think it's human nature to be habitual and follow what other people are doing. But I think some of the most interesting coaches are the ones that really sit back and absorb what they're exposed to and, and self-select to the appropriate amount of frequency and intensity what they're going to want to take from those messages and and and, and then weave it into their philosophy and build upon their own coaching talking they don't change characters all the time they don't become something that they're not truly and and that to me has been something interesting that i've seen with coaches wanting to i mean i i've fallen victim to that somewhat you know i i know that i've had such an exposure to louis Kaye that i can hear myself using his language, his words, his frames, his observation. I even use his eyes now because I've been taught to use his lens, you know, and that's that's really powerful. And Larry, I'd imagine you 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 feel similar to that to me. Is, is that fair? Or? Yeah, it's completely fair. And it's funny, it makes me think back. At one point when I was in the UK, I had a responsibility to, to do a, I guess it was master performance course was probably called at the time for the national coaches. And obviously these national coaches have a wealth of experience uh, in tennis. Uh, and it was interesting because one of the very first things that came up, I asked, you know, everybody's always trying to find some icebreaker. I've never been a huge fan of the standard icebreakers, but I asked the question to everybody to start the process to write down their biggest fear. And a couple people answered when we wrote out, when we answered uh, or when we read them out uh, anonymously, a couple people answered something along the lines of, I don't want to lose who I am by taking this course and uh, so it's an interesting thing that you bring up a lot of people feel that potentially as they're exposed to these things that they will become too much of a, a clone or, or just following that way I, I personally see it differently I see it as you know there's obviously a science to tennis and there's an art to tennis and and um, you know we could argue the biomechanical principles that that connect to open stance or neutral stance or whichever you want that that's not changing who you are who you are is when you do start to address maybe some of the art of what you bring as your personality or, you know, circling back to the first question, your actual values. And so if you stand true to your values and who you are as a person and just grow as a coach by uh, learning more, I think that uh, that's the way to go. But too many people, it's, it's, they find that one person and they're going to just try to clone them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Mike, anything you want to add to that? Well, I think there's a, there's a phrase that comes to mind that I might have even taken this from Larry years ago, this idea of creative adaption over slavish adoption. And, um, you know, is, is being, being open enough to creatively adapt. I think we've got to be open, you know, as, as coaches. As we have, you know, it's so easy to, to, to adopt the need to be right because we're seen as experts, so we should have answers. And I think, you know, to be open to different ideas new information and and then to be able to sort of synthesize that and, and creatively adapt it into your own sort of style and and to perhaps what is uniquely you it would be one thing the other thing that this just got me thinking about was the <clears throat> the risk of overly adapting one's own program to suit the regime of the national governing body in place at the time. And I think that's, that's been an interesting challenge for me personally, leading a program for you know, close to 30 years now in Britain, um, where I've gone through five or six at least uh, changes at, at, at the top of the game from you know, the, the county system early on with county training and through to Patrice Hagelauer and Club Vision and the High Performance Center Network and moving on then into, you know, the, 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 the current system of local player development centers, regional centers, national academy, and, and being, I suppose, being able, you know, fundamentally to be true enough to yourself in terms of what you're doing and how you operate, A, as a business, but B, as a, as a program, so that you're not 
in a way in a way confusing your own either coaches or your own parents and kids by suddenly adopting ah well so and so is in now this is what the what the governing body is saying um and and almost in direct contrast to what we were doing a week ago so i think i think those are real challenges when you're working kind of i suppose on the cold plate at ground level and um is is, is, is how you're bringing in you know good practice new ideas because we've got to keep moving forward and and creatively adapting them and blending them into what you already already are doing so, so that that's a really interesting point because i think this it leads us to two questions um and it's not a pivot because it's about understanding our evolution as a coach and if we if we get scan out from our careers as coaches and and then g give a, a an elevator pitch overview of how you've evolved and changed and developed as a coach how would you how would you describe that mike larry how would you say look when i was 20 this is the kind of coach you would have seen on the court at 28 29 i was this at 30 35 i was this and now this is where i'm this is where i feel i am as a coach this is what i've changed these are my points of, this is where i've been constant and i haven't changed these are the things that have stayed with me throughout my life my values, my personality. Because when you talk about being open, um, I, I found out a word this week, I never heard of this word, neophobia. Neophobia is the, the science of, of how open you are or close you are to new ideas. So I've met a lot of coaches that are fairly close to new ideas, that they, they like to be conservative in nature. They like to be um, traditional. They like to close the borders. You know, it's like, I'm fine as I am. And we probably know who those people are. And our listeners will know who those people are. They're fine as they are. They're not wanting to adapt and regenerate now i think the three of us are in the camp of always wanting to regenerate i often feel that i'm not regenerating fast enough in fact and that's caused me to run with the crowd a lot of the time and, and adopt the fads and trends and and philosophies and regime changes and and learn something from everything that i'm exposed to and that's a philosophy i, I, I believe in since i was a young young boy but um but i wondered if if, if you know you guys would just be kind enough to share a little bit of a, a pan out of your careers as coaches and where you feel that you've made the major step changes in your coaching. I'm sure there have been marginal gains here and there. You've improved your backhand demo and your feeding's got a bit better than marginal stuff, but big picture thinking, what's changed? Larry, do you mind if I um, start with you? Yeah, that, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous question and something that would take a deeper reflection, but a, a, my blink response would be this. You know, I came into coaching. I... I was probably a little different than a lot of people on my pathway because I always wanted to be a coach, but I wasn't a tennis player. I was a hockey player. So I figured I'd be a hockey coach and just by a weird group of uh, circumstances became a tennis coach. So I came into it very, very uh, new to the sport really. And it's funny, you know, I, I talking about a list of mistakes. I hadn't even thought of this one as I was reflecting for the, for the talk. Um, but the first kid that I ever coached that won U14 nationals, I was teaching him to hit his serve like Boris Becker, where he would land on the opposite foot you know and uh and yeah. i realized back as like wow that was uh it's crazy how far off i was or how little i know but the kid won nationals and and he went on to have a decent tennis career and it's because i brought uh you know i always brought two things into my coaching which is i believe that you need to work harder than everybody else is going to work and as a coach it's your one of your primary jobs is to build the belief of your athlete and so if you can churn somebody into somebody who works incredibly hard and has a high level of belief in themselves the sky is the limit and so i think as a coach i had uh I, I hate to say success but i had you know the results i did achieve as a young coach were by doing those two things and then as i start to learn more and, and studied myself and got into all of the more uh, sophisticated understanding of what goes into all the different aspects of tennis holistically um i think i got worse you know and, and i can look back and, and and see stretches of my coaching where i was probably too technical or too this right like i could label it as too anything really um yeah. And I've come full circle back to just saying my kids have to work harder than anybody else's kids and they need to develop a belief in themselves that anything is possible. And all the knowledge I picked up along the way is just just underpins, you know, specific decisions I make in their development or specific tools that I use to help them develop. But uh, but I think just coming back to that notion of work hard and believe in yourself has been the key for my kind of evolution or full circle uh, approach to my career. 
Yeah, it's it's what I I call cradle to grave to cradle. It's a rebirthing <laughs> process, actually, yeah. that you've gone through to understand that some of that stuff at the start was damn important, and it needs to be alive again. And and and, and you know, you put a new twist on an old idea, and you become more sophisticated with that stuff again. But it certainly isn't can't be left out. It's a core ingredient. Mike, what about you? How would you describe your kind of pathway as a coach in terms of how you've evolved? Yeah, I mean. It- a lot of what Larry has just said resonates with me. Uh, my story is slightly different. You know, I, I played tennis to a fairly decent level, college tennis in the U.S. at University of Arizona. And, um, but again, actually wanted to go into coaching from quite an early age. And w- once I did so, which was pretty much after I graduated, I, you know, flirted around with playing a little bit, but, but once I graduated from, from college, it was, um, it was fairly straight into coaching. And I, so I had a pretty decent game, you know, it wasn't amazing, but I had a pretty decent game and I just used that. I got on court and um, just worked hard in front of my players, used my game, trained them a lot. And, and then started to develop, you know, my, my, I suppose, my coaching qualification, my knowledge base, if you like, and, and perhaps went through a similar kind of journey that Larry describes, where I think actually I got worse because I would be starting to throw the whole, you know, the whole kitchen sink um, at the player. I, I, you would learn about some biomechanics and, you know, suddenly I'm talking to them about angular momentum and, uh, you know, all, all, all of it. And the player's just looking at me going, what are, you, what are you on about? And there was part of me so keen to share my knowledge and to show off my knowledge, my newfound knowledge. And, and, then, and then you sort of go over that, you know, you, you, you get over yourself a little bit and um, you, you begin to really draw on, you know, those, those critical moments where actually, well, that, that now I can use that bit of information or that knowledge or, or, or that drill. And you become far more selective, um, a, a, a lot less kind of manic about what, what you're doing. So I think... I can really, I can just really resonate with that kind of that that circle, if you like, of having ha- having all of this sort of information that you gain on your courses, and and even now, I think you know, it's coaches are coaches have got so much that they can tap into um, that we didn't have in the you know late eighties, early nineties, that type of thing, and um, you know, my my journey, I turned fifty three yesterday, so. My, 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 I'm, I'm feeling acutely aware of where I am in my coaching career right now. But um, I think what, what a lot of young coaches have access to in terms of information is in a way, in a way can be dangerous to, to their coaching. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the, the, the challenge really is. is so, so that's, that's the fascinating point for me now then as an educator is to say, Look, the role of the educator has changed. Clearly, it was to deliver knowledge that was that was not readily available to the, the candidate in front of our eyes, and 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 that was the job of the educator. We would present presentations, either the PowerPoint or on the court, and we would give them stuff they didn't have, right? And we would let them explore with it, etc. But now, I think it's changed, right? That's what, that's the major message is what you're saying is that the world has changed. People have access to an infinite amount of knowledge. They may be even more knowledgeable than us in certain areas, especially if they've gone into a niche topic through university or, or through a, something that they have an interest in. But what is the job of the educator now is to facilitate all that learning and to tidy it up for the candidate in order to actually bring about meaningful learning for the candidate. It's to have frameworks, to have to all help them organize their thinking, to help them deliver it more intelligently in order to not go through a period of exploratory type of longevity because you're right it's obviously it's inevitable that as you start to get more experience as a coach you start to be exposed to more philosophies thinking learning conferences whatever that is courses that you are going to be influenced to change what you're doing and that's that's not having neophobia right that's being open to new ways and having a wider repertoire of opportunities to available to you as a coach at the same time is that in these coach exploratory periods of our life it's 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 damage limitation right damage to ourselves damage to the players to the club to the culture and it's how do we navigate that how do we become better 
and and try things because we need to expose ourselves to new ideas without actually having getting worse because as you said both of you said the same thing by getting more experience by getting more ideas by getting more knowledge my coaching probably became more confusing to the athlete became more complicated and it wasn't at all helpful although was it helpful was it an incredibly important period of your coaching that actually if you weren't exposed to that you would be the dinosaur coach that hadn't changed at 21 does, does that make sense that's what i'm trying to wrestle with a little bit Larry wants to come in there. Oh, it's interesting. I, re I read a book a long time ago called Artistry Unleashed. Hilary Austin, I remember, was the author. Uh, great book. And so she talked about it. It was kind of different terminology she used, but she said that there's three things that are required. Her, her notion was artistry was the final level of uh, competence in a field, right? You, you've gotten so good at this, you can now become creative and evolve it as opposed to uh, the stage just below that, which could be mastery, where you master uh, the, the field as it currently stands. And then after that, you have the ability to be creative. And so anyways, uh, she said there's three things. She called the directional knowledge, which was understanding why you're doing this, your passion for it, et cetera. And then there was conceptual knowledge and then uh, experiential knowledge. And there's no chance, you know, you could study all you want, but there's no chance you're going to become a master in this uh, unless you get that experience. There's no doubt it takes those years and those the thousands of hours, et cetera. Um, but the conceptual knowledge is the interesting one for me. And I, I do believe that's where the real gift came for me when I was so young and I had a chance to work with Louis and his in, within his system, because what you're providing at that point is not, you know, you use words earlier like fad or trends you know we're not talking about open stance versus neutral stance i think that was the example you're using we're talking about having an underpinning structure a conceptual knowledge that underpins your coaching sort of a skeleton and so from there because i would have that sort of framework inside my coaching anytime that i'm getting a chance to listen to somebody new and you know, i can always compare that to my I say okay where does that sit inside my structure and if it doesn't sit inside my structure it's a neat experience because i have to reflect and say is there a spot for that and my structure is wrong um, but a lot of times I can just say okay they're using different terms or they're coming at it from a different way but that connects to what I'm doing right here and so having that underpinning foundation that structural concept knowledge of how you coach I think is absolutely key to allow you to get the most from all these experiences and to avoid that neophobia where you can sit there and say I'm, I'm happy to, to challenge my structure against any new information and see where it fits in uh, where maybe it doesn't and I'm going to leave that one or where ultimately I might have to change the structure itself I, I, I don't know if that's too philosophical but that's no no it's exactly exactly the kind of answer I was expecting and it, it's brilliantly articulated Mike was there anything you wanted to jump in on on that Just regarding you know this whole idea of we're exposed to lots of things there's yeah. a danger there's a danger to that how do we navigate through that that haze and that mess cleverly in order to maximize those experiences as a coach rather than being drowned by them yeah. or changed by them I mean, as you say, Larry, Larry put that in, a, in, a, in incredibly in a, an articulate way, and, and I've written already a few things down what you were just saying there, Larry, so I'll, I'll be exploring that a little more. But I think it comes back just to the, the, the whole wider concept of this conversation, which is around mistakes. And, and I suppose, you know, through that, that period of my coaching where I was, you know, I, I think I used the term throwing the kitchen sink at my players, it was a time of great learning for me because I was actually making mistakes. And it comes back to that, Ed, well, I'm, I'm not moving forward as a coach if I'm, if I'm not making mistakes. So the idea of, you know, cutting, cutting your teeth on a player, well, you, you know, we, we have this, well, you shouldn't be, we shouldn't let our younger coaches get out there and cut, cut their teeth on a, on, a, on a good young player. Well, I'm like, why not? How are those young coaches ever going to develop? Uh, and what you've got to maybe put around that coach is, is you know, good mentoring, good support, and, and that coach seeking, seeking, you know, an experienced voice to help them along in that journey. So I think that sort of support structure around our coaches is incredibly important and maybe important, you know, when, when you're working as part of a wider team or a bigger team, that, that might be a little bit easier to, to um, create around somebody. Well, that, that leads to a very practical example, a tangible example that I think <clears throat> we can give to coaches right now, which is, you know what, don't wait for your qualification to seek developmental support because that's what I did wrong. 
I went, I, I was coaching tennis at 16, but just helping out my club, you know, I was a young kid. Then at 18, I went to university. I did a degree in sports coaching. So I was being developed in some type of coaching skills. And we did a lot of practical generic coaching and skills, but that meant something that was not trivial. That, that didn't, that did leave an impact with me. I was learning coaching theory and coaching science. Um, then I left university and I was coaching tennis full time. And between 21 and 20, I think I joined the LTA at 26, maybe 27, I can't remember. I, I didn't really do anything apart from my qualification, which at the time, if I look back, was a pretty poor experience. So I went to the LTA and then all of a sudden I had access to a huge amount of talent. It was Larry, it was Louis, it was Max de Vilda, Carl Mai, Stephen Martins, um, national coaches. And all of a sudden, wow, I was overwhelmed by... I was a little fish in a, you know, in a very big pond. Whereas at my tennis club, I was a hero. I thought I knew everything. There was an arrogance and ego that well, I was producing all the county players in my, um, in my, in my county or certainly a lot of them, I was getting players to nationals. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm the done deed. And what I realized quite quickly is, wow, I didn't know anything. And what an opportunity to learn. And I had an apprentice, I had a 14 year apprenticeship and I'm eternally grateful to the LTA for that because not many people have been able to have been exposed daily to the expertise and talent of, of these individuals. And the LTA at that time was a really vibrant place to be. It was under Roger Draper, which I still believe was the best era to be at the LTA because there was so much investment in talent, in people, in programs and in initiatives to really grow the game and to let talent flourish. So, so certainly my, my major, sorry, it's a long sentence, but the take home from that is that if I could tell my younger self something right now, the mistake I made was that I just started coaching and I didn't source a mentor that would come and watch me over my shoulder to say, why are you saying that? Why are you doing that? Why have you chose that teaching point? That's not appropriate. That's not developmentally right. Let's do this. Look at the progressions you need for this. Maybe you should explain that in a different way. So that would have really moved the dial forwards in my coaching a lot quicker. I had to wait a long time before I realized I didn't know stuff. And I had to, I wait a long time before I, my blind spots were made aware to me. And, um, and, and my coaching course when I was young, didn't really do the deed on that. And, and, and so, so but anyone that's listening to this right now, invest in someone that you think is a credible trusted advisor that could really help steer your coaching and, and open your mind to a wider repertoire of opportunities and options that you could deliver. Um, anything you guys want to add, add to that? Yeah, I'll jump in if you don't mind, Sai. Please, the, please. Uh, yeah. you know, the, what's, uh, what strikes me, and Mike touched on this at the very beginning, but uh, I'll take it one step further maybe and say that, uh, you know, we've got to be careful to make sure that we don't use the word mistake and let it flow into to failure, right? Because too many people are afraid of failing and, and ultimately that might lead them to being, you know, uh, afraid of making mistakes, which, which would be a serious problem because then they won't do anything. And so, uh, you know, I, I think for me, as I was reflecting on this talk, because it is my nature, I started putting all my mistakes into these different categories uh, and, and finding a structure for my errors. And so I had all these mistakes that I would have said were like, lack of experience or knowledge so I just did dumb things but you know, I forgive myself for those and I made a bunch of mistakes that were out of enthusiasm I just so badly wanted something to happen I, I probably took on more than I uh, than I was capable of and I forgive myself for those and then there's this other category of mistakes that I made which I would say were all connected to ego where I just uh, something was too much uh, a push for me with respect to challenging my ego or my ego being uh, in, in such a way that I thought I could do something that really looking back I probably couldn't and and it's the mistakes of ego that I that I truly regret if I'm honest with you the restri the, the the mistakes of enthusiasm or the mistakes of uh, lack of knowledge you know that how are you going to get the experience if you if you don't just race through those mistakes if you know what I mean yeah that, that's a really that's a really good point I mean I, I'll just share a story because I didn't give you one of the areas that I've changed in my coaching and, and if I pan out and I think about when I was a young 23, 24, 25 year old. There wasn't particularly a lot of people working in performance coaching in the era I was working. Large tennis club, East Gloss, 28 court facility, still I think the largest tennis facility in the Southwest of England. And it was an outdoor program and I was running a lot of the performance program there, but I was young, I was inexperienced to do it, but gee, I had the energy and passion. Um, but one of the things that, 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 that was amazing when I look back now, and it's something I'm a bit embarrassed about, but I think I would share with people because it's a good story to tell. And if it resonates with someone else right now, then maybe it will make a difference. Is that I felt in order to be a performance coach of 12 and under players, 
that you needed to be a tyrannical dictator. That's what I thought. You had to be the drill sergeant. You had to be um, bullish in your delivery. You had to not give them breaks, not hit them thousands of balls all the time, feed, 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 push them, demand lots of them. And of course, a lot of those things I still believe are to be true, which is to be demanding. But what I was giving was a high level of challenge, but not a high level of support. My support was actually around um, looking through a deficit lens. You're not working hard enough. You're not good enough. You're not going to make it. And, and when I think back, to, I would actually hate to watch myself as a coach between 20 and 23. I think I'd be deeply embarrassed by it because I really believed, and maybe that's because I was exposed to two or three other people that were like that, that I felt in order to, to, to survive in the performance world, you had to be a tough, mean, alpha male bully. And... <clears throat> And I think over time, what happened is I softened and I was exposed to people that were far more sophisticated than me at improving performance without having to take on that, that role. Now, do I believe we have to be prescriptive, informative and confronting sometimes? Absolutely. But to, be, to, to tip that over into being aggressive or to being judgmental or to attacking the behaviours of individuals, that's the part of my coaching that I feel... Um, deeply ashamed of really but and, and I hope by sharing the story with you I'm catching people out right now by saying look if you're going on the court and you're taking your baggage with you from your life which you will if your girlfriend dumps you or that player leaves you it's so difficult not to project those experiences into the next lesson very difficult to do that not to not do that but it's a that is what I would call a mistake in coaching to 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 allow other people to experience your own personal um frustration aggression anger any type of emotions that's driving how you're coaching and it's all so easy to do that and that's another mistake I made as a coach I would I would want to say yes to everyone never say no work seven days a week and I was tired and the more tired I got the worse my behavior became in, in terms of I mean there was nothing untoward but there was always I, I would find myself getting anger as the week went on or getting more frustrated or getting certainly more bullish and and, and more tyrannical then my players having to rely on on feedback dependency really because I was the one saying everything I was the one seeing everything I was the one doing everything and and, and over time I managed to become much softer and stand back speak less um, ask more questions and, and that's not to swing the pendulum completely the other way I'm still very authoritative when I want to be however I've definitely shaved off the the dead skin of, of my younger self which could be could, could be perceived perhaps maybe as that kind of bullish performance coach so that's a practical example i think you know in a nutshell when i scan out over time how i used to be as a young coach and how i am now i would think i would be much more telling stories so you know before it was oh, gonna do two cross court one on the line now let's go I, I would be delivering activity i wouldn't be coaching I think a lot of people deliver activity very well, better than me. But I think one of my strengths is that I can, you know, sell ice to the Eskimos and and telling great tactical stories to excite the player for the hour and a half that they have with me is such an important skill. And if coaches could do that, you know, you're playing on the clay now, guys, the guy's going to be hitting high balls to your backhand. How are you going to back up and deal with that defensive ball? And what are the different ways you can intercept on you know, these excitable stories that you can start to tell and then go wherever you want to go drive the lesson is such an important skill that i believe that you know mike on the level fours and fives that we've delivered over the last 10 years uh, that's the bit that's always been the biggest thing to try and get the coaches to change to be exciting and um and and tactical and game based in their approach to delivery so sorry i've jumped around a little bit there but if anything is to inspire maybe some of your thinking to add to that yeah i mean i think simon it just triggered something for me where, where an experience I had around, I suppose, not quite the, the, the tyrannical bit, but maybe being, you know, highly directive um, in one's in one's younger years, perhaps because of the people around you or what you experienced yourself as a as a younger player. But it was a it was a situation really around um, around game styles. And I was working with a player who was. She was quite small. It was around the time where Arancha Sanchez Vicario was uh, was having a lot of success in the sport, you know, playing with heavy topspin, grinding from the back. And I was working with a national level player who who was um, similar build, and I thought, well, that's the that's the game for you. That's how you've got to play. 
And, you know, and I was sort of really, really pushing this. She was probably 14, 15 at the time, really pushing this agenda with her. And actually, you know what she wanted to do? She wanted to, she wanted to hit the ball flat. She wanted to hit it hard. She wanted to come in and volley. She wanted to play a completely different game. And, and I think it's, it's really, really, you know, when it comes back to that journey, is it about coach first or is it about player first? And, and really, really understanding and getting into the player, how they operate, how they want to play the game, how they see the game and, and helping them with that rather than imposing something on them and imposing a game style or imposing a technique or, you know, knowing when to, when, when is it right to change a grip on the forehand? You know, I've had, I've had a, a couple of examples where I've changed extreme forehand grips to, to something a little less extreme that have worked brilliantly. But I've also had a situation where it was, it was a disaster area. And, um, you know, I was, I was for months after, you know, trying to rescue this, this, this forehand of this, of this girl who had, you know, it's pretty decent, but it was like, no, nope, no, you, you're too far around. You've got to, you've got to change that grip. So I think that whole, that whole area of what does the coach impose and what does the coach actually elicit and draw out of, of, of the player is, is fascinating. It's a great point. We've lost Larry for a minute. I'm sure he'll jump back on in a second. But um, but but you're right. It's 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 having again that right that degree of degree of fitting in again, isn't it? It's degree of, of sticking to the plan, having something in your mind, feeling like something's not right. A change is needed. Um, you want to try and apply that change to the level of the individual. That's important. It's not like or oh, we should every grip that's extreme is wrong. And therefore, we need to go back to a semi Western grip, and therefore, that's right. But there are a lot of players with a pretty extreme grip that have done all right in the game, and and therefore, it's it's about. There's always another way of looking at the problem, right? It's like if you want to lose weight, for that guy, maybe eat less, and for that guy, maybe exercise more, and for that guy, um, you know, whatever it is, walk more. And it, it, there's always a different tactic to the strategy, and therefore, that's a great example. And I've fallen into that. I remember having working with a girl that had a rather large forehand. You know, she it was really combing her hair and I knew that that it was causing her to be late there was a rationale for change there was not like she was still doing this and timing the ball beautifully on the on the center of the strings for me it was more around well how do I get her to change and I would spend a lot of time doing mini progressions and but then when she went back into a live ball situation it just wasn't changing she had an habitual need to want to still comb her hair with the preparation and 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 that took a lot of a lot of persuasion. And what I realized is that I, I, after time, I'd never shown her. I'd actually never shown her her beforehand. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. using technology to help me out. I was sweating my verbal and creative mind to try and solve the problem, but I wasn't solving the problem. And it was actually as soon as I am, um, it was as soon as I started to show her on my iPad just the level of extremeness to her preparation style that actually she said, shit. And that created a, a, a real kind of vision and, 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 a, and a need for her to want to try and change it herself. It's like the most person, the most powerful person to change someone is yourself. Um, and therefore, if you can in, if you can in, get into the mind first, then often the body will find a way to solve the problem. And and and, and that was just a little example which echoed your point around the extreme good. So Mike, let let's let's pivot on to, to parents because. You know, if we're working with in, in player development at any age and stage of the pathway, then we're going to be encompassing the parent. And and I often think the parent can be painted out as the villain in the triangle and, and everything good is done by the coach and the player. And, and of course, we know that's not true in the slightest. And I wondered if you would have any experiences that you wanted to share around where you've got things, you know, maybe right or wrong with parents or where other people are making mistakes when they're working with parents. What, what's your um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think there was a key moment perhaps for me in my coaching where the, the phrase, and you still hear it an awful lot, where coaches will say, oh, well, you've got to deal with the parents. And you said, you know, how powerful language is earlier on. And I think when I really understood that rather than deal with parents, that I was going to work with parents, that, that became a real shift in my own in my own sort of behaviors and mentality that, you know, the parent, particularly around the young player, 
has actually an awful lot to contribute to the discussion. They know their kids. And it's, it's, it's ensuring that you bring, bring the, the parent into that equation and, and, and work with them uh, with, 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 with a view to ultimately helping the player out. Because, because uh, you know, the, the, the parent will spend 90% of the time with the younger player, where I might spend, you know, two or three hours a week. The parent is there at home influencing using language that, that we've just got to we've got to get in on and, and and help so I think coming back to the idea I've got to work with I've got to coach I've got to co-create collaborate with parents um, I think is incredibly important so whether I point you know whether I point exactly to a, a, a situation that I can remember um, uh, you know, there's there's so many sort of that, that come to mind really yeah. But of course, you know, and, and I'm, I'm working with a number of parents at the moment. I coach you know, seven or eight players individually, so I have that relationship. But then as director of tennis for a program, I'm, I'm constantly talking and working with parents who are working with other members of my coaching team. Uh, and, and so the whole ability to communicate um, in an in an adult way with with parents is 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 crucial. I find it a lot easier now. You know, I have an 18 year old and a 16 year old, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a long way into the parenting journey myself. So being able to speak from the perspective of having kids has has helped me enormously. I'm not saying that coaches, you know, you need to have kids in order to become a great coach and work well with parents, but I think that process has helped me, given me a lot more empathy, given me a lot more understanding and awareness of what happens. You know, why is the kid completely knackered? Um, you know, come come Friday 4 p.m. because they've done a full week at school, they've had exams, they've had this, they've had that. And um, just just getting in on that whole parenting bit, I think, has been been instrumental for me and really helpful for me in my coaching. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you know, as you know, Mike, I I wanted to write a book, and everyone says, "Oh, you wrote a book for parents." Well, no, I didn't write a book for parents. I wrote a book for the for the trio to read together in tandem. That was the idea. It was I wanted to write a book that if you read all these seven chapters, and it's called the Sweet Spot. If anybody wants to. To Google the Sweet Spots on Weekly, it's I think it's a useful resource that that will help, you know, especially if you have a parent and a player that's that's on the competitive pathway, um, because what the book will do is to centralize centralize some of the the challenges and barriers that you're going to have in the relationship. It's not going to point out a dot to dot solution, but what it will do is provide you with lots of tools as the player, the parent and coach to understand how you can help each other through the process. And so that was an ambitious aim with the book. And look, I don't know if I achieved it or not, but certainly some of the feedback I've received from people in the book lends itself to believe that it's been a helpful, you know, a helpful aid in, in, in the partnership. It's, it's created less drama triangles. It's made people more empathetic towards each other's, you know, roles and responsibilities. Now, I guess the, the bit that I wanted to talk about was, you know, we've all dealt with, dealt with, I've even said it myself, we're all working and navigating with parents at, at different levels of degree and intensity. You know, sometimes they're all in and sometimes parents are more hands off. And there's always a bit of push and pull there between you as the coach to try and get to a better place. Um, Larry, you're, you're someone that I heard recently talk about on the Functional Tennis Podcast, I think it was, about your interpretation of working with parents. And I don't know if you remember what you said on that. And I can't remember exactly verbatim what you said, but it was an interesting take on the parent relationship. Yeah, uh, by the way, Simon, chalk up trying to do a Zoom outside whilst at a tournament as one of my mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It was that. It's not, it's not, it's not an error, it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I might have shared this story on the Functional Tennis Podcast. I can't remember, but it's all couched in this. I, I'm reading this book right now that's called Extreme Ownership. It's an incredible book written by a couple Navy SEALs, and they talk about how, you know, you have to take ownership over every aspect of what you're doing. And obviously, too many people don't do that. You're, you use this triad you mentioned earlier. I can't remember what it was, but essentially, you know, there's people that are being victims in relationships and this and it, in the end, you know, as leaders 
leaders, I believe that we need to take complete ownership. And so the relationship with the parents is something that I feel the coach has to own. You can't be a victim and say, oh, that that parent is making my life tougher. That's a, in the end, this is what I know. You know, I've got two daughters myself, just like Mike mentioned his children. And I and I we saw yours at the very beginning there. Um, you, you realize that there's just no chance that a parent isn't doing what they think is best for their child. There's no chance. And so if you understand that they're doing what they think is best for their child, and if you don't think that what they're doing is best for their child, then what you got is an education gap, not a values gap or not anything like that. And so the job is simply to help the parent understand uh, what needs to be done differently or better. And so I'll give you a great example. And again, I apologize if I did this on the Functional Tennis Podcast, I don't remember. But there's a little girl in our program who started right from Red Bull, one of these real cradle, hopefully to tour one day players. And so she had, had one of the coaches in the club during Red Ball, and then she had a second coach while she was going through kind of orange and green. And then when she moved on to yellow ball, I took her on. And so this, uh, this girl, her family's from China. Her dad doesn't speak the best English in the world, um, but he's an unbelievably supportive family. And the dad would like to be on the court picking up balls and stuff during the lesson. I've never had a problem with that. I know a lot of coaches shy away from it, but for me, I, I've, uh, I've always felt it was better that the parents understood more what was going on in the court and what we we're doing uh, than trying to make it in some way secretive or something. So, so I would always allow the parents on the court. And it was interesting, about six months into this coaching relationship, for the very first time, the father, because again, he doesn't speak English, while we're picking up balls, he said something to his daughter in Mandarin. And, uh, and one of the coaches that used to work with him from the club uh, pulled me aside later and goes, ah, he used to do that all the time when I was coaching her. And, uh, and I was wondering how long he would, it would take before he would do it to you. And I said, and it was interesting because I said, you know, I, I dealt with that completely differently. And, and I, I wrote this uh, gentleman a really long email because obviously, again, he doesn't speak great English. I thought it'd be the best way to communicate with them. And essentially, it just came down to the, the fact that I, I tried to teach him my understanding of what feedback needs to look like. And so we know there's uh, internal and external feedback. And sometimes this is the bottom line. It's too long of a story, I think, Sai, but the bottom line was he got involved and started talking to her when he, when he saw her doing something and I didn't intervene, right? And so I had to build some trust from him to understand that if I didn't intervene, it was for a reason. It was either because I was trying to let her figure it out on her own or you know, watch and you'll see that as much as I didn't say something, I still have body language or I still changed the drill or I still did something like this. So I was trying to use something other than just your standard feedback uh, to try to create a change in behavior. But the, the, the most important part of all of it, that I said to him in the end, I said, just know that when she does something on the court and I don't say something, it's not because I missed it. It's not because I don't care. It's because I've chosen a different feedback strategy. And if you say something to her, you might actually be damaging the strategy that I'm trying to use. And he came back so apologetically, like, oh, Larry, I'm so sorry. I just thought that, you know, you're busy and maybe you didn't see that one or something yeah. like that. And so really, uh, we just had to get to the point that he trusted that I was 100 percent focused when I was out there and that I and I was uh, being intentional with the way I was approaching it and not being laissez faire or carefree. Um, and so as soon as he trusted me in that way, it's never happened again. And, you know, it's funny, I want to give props to Mike, because I hope you remember this, Mike, but, you know, he was when when, when I had that role at the LTA, he was kind enough one day to bring uh, to invite me out in my professional capacity, but he told me to bring my daughter. And she was probably eight years old at the time. And we went to the Halton Air Force Base. And we did all these, these uh, up on like the high wire, like it was crazy stuff we're doing. It was so much fun. Um, but the whole day was about kind of connecting the coaches and the parents and the kids as, as a team. And that was trans transformational for me. It, it really, um, I never felt like I had a big problem with parents. That's not a, an experience I've had. Uh, but that really led me to an understanding of how important it was to see this as an entire team. And the last thing I'll say, sorry, I'm rambling now, but the last mm -hmm. thing I'll say is that as part of that process, Mike brought everybody in at the end and we had this kind of like... Um, debrief at the end of the day in the office and uh, I hope I'm not um, uh, keeping uh, passing on any secrets of yours Mike but as he was talking to the parents a tear was coming to his eye and he was talking about you know I really want to thank you for the trust that you've put in us that you've trust your children with us and we, and we take that responsibility very seriously and so I think that that level of vulnerability to the parents was probably something I was never open to before seeing that and so I think this is it I think we need to be vulnerable with the 
families. We need to make sure that we build trust with them. We need to start with the premise that they're doing what they think is best for their children. And, and if we start with that as our overall thinking, I'm pretty sure these relationships will be healthy. It's a great point. And it's a great story. And knowing Mike as I do, I can, I can, I can imagine the impact that's had on Halton. It's known throughout the country as an environment which has fosters people's development in a very healthy way. So, so a big credit to Mike. I mean, Mike, is there anything you wanted to add to that about working with parents and players and the relationships? I think it's, a, it's such a fascinating sort of dynamic with, you know, the, the, almost as Larry was talking about the on-court parental involvement. And, and I think it's about judging when is it helpful that the parent is involved and sees the session. And because fundamentally the parent is paying for the session. So they, they, they want to know, am I getting value? Is the coach engaged is, you know, so they have every right to be there and to watch and to observe and, sometimes to be even more active if you've got a parent who plays tennis and hits with their hits with their kids it's more helpful that they're on the court and they can reinforce the things that we might be doing and then there's a moment where actually it's important for the parent to get lost to allow the coach to develop their own relationship unique relationship with that player that players behave differently when their parents are not there yeah and, and I'll often see that in, you know, in school sessions where parents come in and then suddenly the, there's a 10, 11 year old and he's, he's suddenly a little bit more inhibited. He's a little bit more focused on the outcome. He's, he's looking over at the dad a few times. He's, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the dynamic of the session can change. And, and I'm always fascinated by sports where, you know, perhaps gymnastics for example i don't know where, where the parent is just simply not allowed in the hall yeah because of the danger factor that the, the kid has to be so focused on what they're doing rather than you know seeing the parent and eye contact and whatever that might mean and my my son is heavily into basketball uh, believe it larry believe it or not larry over here in the, in, in england but he's uh, he, he plays for a club loves his basketball the parent wouldn't think about entering the hall during the practice just wouldn't think about it you know you watch from the outside or through the glass or whatever it is and it's it's just it's a fascinating fascinating dynamic but i think perhaps over time where i've become more confident is to be more confronting not confrontational so i, I think i picked that one up from you simon yeah confronting <laughs> confrontational good um, of situations and you know to air things out and to get things on the table and to talk about it you know we have an expression that we call get the fish on the table right because you know if you leave the fish underneath the table and you don't deal with things you don't confront things it, you know it starts to kind of smell and the smells seep out don't they anyway so let's get the fish on the table let's gut it that's a pretty unpleasant process but at the end of that what you've got is a right, nice piece of fish to eat and I think it's that that process of and that comes I suppose with experience with maturity with getting a little bit older that you feel more comfortable to have these more confronting conversations with parents to say you know I get I trust your intention and I think what Larry said there was so powerful about you know rarely if ever do we meet a parent who feels that they are not doing the right thing for their kids yeah and and I think is, is, is to, to, to raise awareness in parental behavior and say, you know, if you use that language, oh, you're so talented or you're so clever or you're so this, do you think that it might be developing uh, uh, maybe an unhelpful mindset in your, in, in your kid as opposed to they come home 10 out of 10 on their spelling tests and it's like, oh, wow, you worked so hard for that, didn't you? You know, that's a very, very different message between, oh, you're so clever and, oh, you've worked so hard for that. And I think just being, getting to that point where you, you, you can have these conversations and be confronting without being confrontational, I think is a real skill. So, so I, I've got this theory. Let me, let me say it to you two and, and tell me what you think, because I'm not sure about this. I'm not certain, but I think there's some legs in it. So a lot of coaches struggle to speak with parents they do. They, they would choose the basketball option in a heartbeat, Mike. Drop your kid off, pick them up. 
um, don't text me, don't WhatsApp me, don't want to talk to you. Just you know, you you pay the bill. That, and and often that could be the it could be an, an old coach that's decided that that's their that's their raison d'etre, or it could be a young coach that doesn't necessarily have the skills yet to be able to deal with it. And and I think that's the one I'm I'm interested in. That the younger coach that could go either ways. You know, there are two paths. Choose, choose the one wisely. And and what I think it is is this. Okay, often young tennis coaches. And this is, you know, this is an edgy topic, so bear with me. But look, the reason why I had these coaching conversations webinars was to be slightly edgy. Most tennis coaches are tennis coaches that they're not trained as lawyers or doctors, you know, PhDs. You know, we, we, we maybe went to university, or maybe we didn't. A lot of coaches I know didn't have a, a degree. They stopped their education at 16, 18, um, and they hit a lot of balls. And then they fell into coaching. We, they're often in their 20s, early 30s, but they're having to essentially be the leader of the trio the coach, with people that are from the middle class to upper class background, often very well educated parents, very high powered jobs, very articulate, very knowledgeable, very experienced, very quick, high IQ, very high IQ. And, and, and I don't know if necessarily that that is incredibly threatening, intimidating to young coaches. And therefore, the, when we're intimidated, overwhelmed and threatened, it's fight, flight or freeze or run. And I think people run away from it. I think they choose the default stress setting, which is to be able to move away from potential confrontation. Because to get in a battle, it's like I wouldn't want to do a webinar with Jordan Peterson. <laughs> you know, he would he would take me to town. So therefore, I wouldn't. So you chose me and Larry. Hey, Simon. I chose you and Larry. Yeah, <laughs> people have the similar IQ to me. But um, but 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 certainly, but certainly, I think that that is something that is is going on behind the scenes with young coaches. That that there would be an intimidation. And well, that the fact that actually the people we're having to lead are often way more life experience, age experience. They've got children. They just tick so many more boxes. And and actually they expose us correctly and it's uncomfortable one of the lessons i learned very early on in life is that sometimes parents are right about tennis and they know nothing about tennis and they're still right so for example one of the mistakes i used to make with parents if i if i may share this with you is um i, I didn't used to do the schedule i used to let them do the schedule themselves and then they would know well, why am i you know you're the coach you know tennis you know the tournament system you know the structure when do they play tennis you're upside to and, and, and I'd say, oh, you do that. You don't pay me for that. You pay me for coach a child. So I didn't contract in the, 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 the extra stuff that was needed to be done to be a great performance coach. And therefore, when they would speak to other parents, they would then say, well, look, our academy sort of takes care of that. And they, they give us good direction on that. And, uh, and they take the players on trips and, and they do the tournament schedules. They, they go to tournaments with them and they give parents presentations. And there was lots of things I wasn't doing because I didn't have the skill set to do. And I find that deeply uncomfortable being challenged by the coach as a young coach because I, I didn't necessarily, because they were right, essentially. And, and I think that it takes someone very humble to, and at the time, you know, I wasn't humble enough. I, I fought back against it. I felt they were being too overpowering. They were pushing too much. No, the reality was they weren't pushing enough because they should have got rid of me. And but because they knew I was passionate and, and I loved to hit and, and sweat and, and 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 I was into it and I'd reply to their messages that they 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 saw that there were lots of skills in in the coach that was going to help their child but I wasn't what I could have been and and that's probably the biggest lesson that that I would would probably say to coaches is that you aren't as good as you think you are and you aren't as bad as you think you are because there's an imposter there's an imposter syndrome there as well I think with coaches is that. Should I be? Am I good enough to work with this player? Can I take them to the next level? Am I really? Should I? Be? And then there are some coaches that are real imposters that shouldn't be where they are, and we know people like that. And then, and then there are some coaches that literally will do everything they can to learn, grow, and develop. And I think those are the ones that that have an appetite for for improving themselves. And that constant, never-ending improving attitude is something that I've always had. And that's why I chose you two, because you two also have that. I, I'm not reading enough books, and I read a lot of books. I'm not watching enough webinars and YouTube lectures, and I watch a lot of YouTube lectures and webinars. I don't just stick on Netflix and, and Cobra Kai every night. That's a treat. My, 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 my go-to setting as a coach is to learn, 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 learn. And when I'm absolutely exhausted, then I, I give myself a treat. But but I, I don't know if everyone's like that. I think I'm built differently. And I think we're built differently to a lot of people. But the more people we can level up to, to a culture of learning and developing is something that I think would be healthy for them in their coaching. Sorry, that's a long ramble. But anything you want to jump in on the last kind of three minutes I've just been talking, please do. Yeah, you know what? The, you, you mentioned reading there. And I know I've chucked a couple books in there already. But one of the 
one of the one of my favorite books over the last 15 years and i know most everybody's read that one is outliers right and uh I would, I, I would challenge everybody to be reading constantly. I, I said from a very young age, I've, I've never met a successful person that doesn't read a lot. And, you know, I'm sitting there listening to Mike. And again, I hope I'm not giving your secrets away, Mike, but Mike starts talking about growth mindset versus fixed mindset without using the words. I'm like, okay, just give that parent the Carol Dweck book and, uh, and she'll get that, right? And, and so I think that it's really important that we're, we're hungry uh, for knowledge, we're hungry for information, but in outliers, you know, when it would break down anybody's success, Bill Gates' success was, you know, one of the ones that people always talk about. And it talks about all these different things, right? It takes, it takes hard work and it takes passion. It takes opportunity. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that you can't be successful um, without a, a thirst for knowledge, uh, humility to learn from others. And so I think, Simon, you've said it beautifully uh, throughout, the, throughout the talk here. You said you've got to go be willing to find somebody find a mentor. Uh, you've got to be hungry for knowledge. I think read, read all the time. Um, personally, if I was hiring somebody to teach my kids anything, if they weren't willing to do those things themselves, as far as looking to always get better, no chance I hire that coach. Yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point, isn't it? It's a, it is it is an old adage that the best way to make your players better is to make yourself better. It's actually not playing more tennis and you know, morbid yeah. analysis and all those little yeah. attention to the big picture and not attention to the detail. Louis would say that a lot. And I love that expression. There's too many people that are, you know, attending to details all the time, but they're not really seeing the big picture of themselves, their players, their environment, their learning, their career. And, and the more we can do that as coaches, the more healthy that will be. Mike, anything you want to add to, to that? Just just to follow up on what you said there, Simon, I think this idea of bringing, and, and Larry, of course, is, is bringing new things to the relationship. I think that's the perhaps one of the key responsibilities of the coach is, is what is it, what new are you bringing to the relationship? And so much of that might come through, you know, what you've read. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm reading book that's been out for a while now but it's you know about the all blacks and the success that the all blacks uh, the massive success of the all blacks and even if it's just a phrase or two or if it's an anecdote or if it's a story it's just something that you're constantly bringing to the relationship and there's always a moment isn't there in coaching that's what i love about it where if, if we're constantly reading and 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 picking up things and listening and and having conversations like this you know something out of this conversation today will will i will drop into my coaching next week um and when that moment comes i don't know but there will be that moment where it might be you know that i that i drop in the the that little dynamic around mastery and artistry uh, you know i love that larry it's and i'm going to find that uh, artist artistry unleashed and an extreme ownership those are two books that that are going straight onto my list so yeah i think it's that that constant learning and bringing new things into the relationship is absolutely key look guys this has been really really cool uh, really cool and and thank you so much for giving up your time to to speak with me on this uh, webinars as i said the purpose of doing this is to try and bring you know intelligent thinkers of tennis together pick one topic and then just have a really informal discussion and see how it's impacted us in our careers and how we can help others move move the dial forwards in their coaching and and sometimes as a coach it's about marginal gains getting better month for month year by year and then sometimes it's about having step changes and, and all of us have had those step changes where we've been exposed to things that have really changed us as coaches for the better and and, and for the permanent. And, and I think people like Louis Kerr has been a massive influence in me and my career um, and Stephen Martins and, and Carl Myers and, and, and the two of you I've worked with shoulder to shoulder. And it's I've learned so much from others and I'm, and I'm better because I've been exposed to others. And I think that's really just a healthy outlook on, on, on improving as a coach. So look, thank you so much for your time. I would love to get you two on again. And I'll definitely ask Larry to be inside rather than outside next time. But, uh, <laughs> but I am looking forward to getting lesson back to learned. you. Lesson learned. It's a definitely a lesson learned. Yeah, technology is much better on the inside, Larry. Um, listen, guys, have a great day. Larry, good luck at the tournament with your, with your players. Mike, thanks very much. It's your week off, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, I'll um, look forward to catching up with you soon, and, and thanks very much.